cusp of destiny at beautiful Belmont Park as things are quiet and serene on this Sunday morning and there's few things in life as pleasant and enjoyable as a morning during the training hours here at Belmont Park but it isn't hard to imagine looking at the quiet and pastoral views here to imagine a raucous house, 90,000 this Saturday. We await American Farrow. It's the MIG, Richard Migliori, Andy Sterling, Jason Blewett alongside. How you guys doing? Doing great. Couldn't be better. Totally agree with you. It's great to be at Belmont. I'm doing great, and I love when you wax poetic. That was actually really <laughs> was good. Was it all right? Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was beautiful. Yeah. All right. Well, we have got a lot of ground to cover. It's a new month, a new racing report. We're glad you're with us. And we spend the bulk of the show at Penn National. They had their slots, purses, and full swing Saturday evening, so sit tight for that. It's a real turf-centric show, though. We kick things off on the grass, the Penine Ridge. That was the feature here on Saturday. Three-year-olds in the local prep for the Belmont Derby. I thought this was a heck of a worse race, Richie, and, and, and it was really a terrific battle down the stretch between two very good horses. Yeah, extremely good horses that threw it down. Um, I, I'm curious as we get into the stretch, and I'm going to ask you about the third-place finisher who hadn't been seen since October. Do you think he can improve a great deal off of this effort? I do think he can. I, I think Startup Nation got the perfect run out of this race. It was a moderate pace, as it always is in these mile and eighth races, which I don't love here on the inner turf course. And he just sort of sat back, and I think he did some running at the end. And considering the way the race was run, the talent of the horses and his layoff, I don't see why, moving forward, he can't be every bit as good as anybody in this race. Yeah, that, that's kind of the way I was looking at it. I was just looking for some affirmation of what I thought I saw, too. But um, that aside, the top two put on some show. I thought that maybe, possibly, I read Ortiz was just a bit overconfident and maybe should have put some separation between him and the winner when he had an opportunity to. He rode him almost the same way he did in the mile of 16th race last time when he was able to be covered up and he got to angle out in the stretch and that was I think on the widener when he got to make his one run. It's a much different race on the inner where speed and position is much more important. Now he's three wide here because the pace is more tepid. The Visadoro who wins the race, he had made that premature move but he got him into the race. He gets on his flank and you can see it clear as day what Richie's talking about. Arad isn't moving a muscle to almost the eighth pole. Yeah, Irad's sitting very still. The rider, Rafael Hernandez, on the eventual winner, has already been kind of asking his horse, not not full out, but he's asking him to keep in contact. Irad peeked at him there. He took another peek at him coming up, and he finally sets him down. But this other horse seemed more relentless and less a turn of foot, and maybe if you had put a length there, he wouldn't have been able to make it up. I, I completely agree with you. I think Irad thought, when I asked this horse, he's going to burst away, but there's a big difference between being covered up in those widener races and getting to get out in the clear and do that run than having to grind it out on the inner turf course, and he's not going to have that kind of explosion. Honestly, Richie, no horse would, and I think he overestimated the kind of run he could have made. And it's an easy thing to fall into when, when you, you know, you're used to asking a horse and they give you that instant acceleration to expect it to be there. Now, let's be fair, too. DeVisadero, the winner, is very good. Very good. He's very good, but I think that's one of the reasons that Arad maybe was too patient. He underestimated the talents of the horse to his flank, and as you said, his rider was just gearing him up, and he's a horse that may get stronger the farther they go, and I don't think he gave his horse the best chance, but I don't think either one of us want to take anything away from DeVisadero, Jason. No, he's three for four in his career, has yet to run a bad one, picked off a good horse in a lot, who's trained by Bill Mott and uh, exited uh, DeVisadero's uh, win against him to take the Paradise Creek, and and does this strike you as the kind of horse that may stretch out and go a mile and a quarter in the Belmont Derby? I imagine DeVisadero, of all the horses in here, he could go a mile and a quarter, a mile and a half. And I think we're going to see all the first four finishers come back yeah. to the Belmont Derby, along with Bolo, who had a sensational return, perhaps others, and also Euros. Yeah, I, I think the mile and a quarter actually plays to his strength. I think he's kind of a relentless kind of horse that just keeps coming, gets a lot of air. And you said he was three for four, Jason. In his only defeat. He had excuses. He might have been best that day. He had, a, he had a lousy trip in a race today. Campari won and made a wide move, but he was trying to come again. I, I agree with Richie. This, this is a, a very good horse, and I think listen, they're not, I don't want to say that they're Artie Schiller and Kitten's Joy because those were truly exceptional horses, and maybe they'll, these horses will prove to be, but we need to see it over time. But I think these are unusually good three-year-old turf horses. They're going to do some good things as the year progresses. Yeah, I, I agree with all that, and speaking of Kitten's Joy, 
as, as far as their their battles on the racetrack, Kitten Strike proved a bit better than Artie Schiller. Um, obviously, going a little further, but as a stallion, Kitten Strike I think is way in front. It's like a firm to Alidar. Yeah. Firm used to beat Alidar the racetrack, but the shed Alidar had no peer. Yeah, Kitten Strike standing for a hundred k. He's got a good one in the form of the VZ Darrow, and we'll see a few other three-year-old turf horses battle it out. A Calvary charge down to the wire, and Joel timed it right. Saturday at the Pen. Stay tuned. A well-known and documented drought in the Triple Crown Department over the last 37 years. Does that exclusive club of 11 get some company on Saturday? American Farrell will go to the post at around 6.30, 6.45 p.m. And he will play his part as destiny awaits on this Belmont Stakes Day 147. Do not wait. We are not selling Belmont Stakes tickets on track Saturday. You've got to get them in advanced fashion do that at BelmontStakes.com. You don't want to get shut out. No, and there's no reason to get shut out. Just buy your tickets. Go to BelmontStakes.com. Extremely easy. Get the tickets. Come out here. It's going to be a great day. I wouldn't want to be anyplace else. I mean, I, you know, we're racing fans besides working in the industry. <laughs> you want to be here if you care about this game at all. And it's an easy game, as Andy said, at BelmontStakes.com. Penn National got their night in the sun. They had a few stakes on Saturday. Some rich purses, none bigger than the half a million up for grabs in the Penn Mile. So it was a big field. I think 11 went to the post, and we will pick it up with the grainy video from the gate. They may call it the Penn Mile, but we here at Naira proudly refer to it as the Dan Silver Mile, because this was really the brainchild of Dan Silver when he left us and went to work at Penn National. We, of course, have Dan back working with us here. Uh, this was a cavalry charge down the stretch. The question I want to ask you is, and it's easy in result, going down the backside towards the turn, the second finisher, Knight Prowler, is three wide. The winner forced the pass is inside of him, and the third finisher, Grains Kittens, on the rail. Does Javier make too, move too soon, or is that a resulting comment on a horse that he did the right thing, the other horses got out, and they ran him down right in the shadow of the wire? I think the best horse won on the night. So, I, 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 you know, for me to say he moved too soon would be contradicting the way I looked at the race. Maybe he did move a bit soon, but we talk about this in the Penine Ridge. Sometimes you want to get a little celebration and a horse might outkick you. I think he just got run, run down by a horse that was extremely good on this evening. I, I think it's a great juxtaposition to the Penine Ridge because we can't say that Rodden, it's a, it's a very different situation, but when, is, when do you move too soon? Javier Castellano's not making a lot of mistakes. He decided when to push the button, and in this case, as you see him moving four wide and to the lead in here, those horses are trapped behind him. Joel is cool as a cucumber. He's in the two bad as you said. He came out a little bit. Jose Ortiz is waiting patiently on the rail. He ends up getting out too. Both these guys get out. They get in room very, very late. But you know what? Night Prower has a chance to win. Yeah, and, and, and you know, how, what, what would you have given for Force the Pass? At the eighth pole, I mean, he looked like he was buried and going nowhere, and he was basically having to steer him through rush hour traffic, and then finally the last 16th, he could actually ride him, and he ran out of time to even go to the whip, and I just think he flew home. No, I, I don't disagree with any of that. I had to watch it two or three times to get a sense of where he was and the kind of run he made. I mean, listen, in some ways, I guess the argument is that Night Prowler's move broke the race apart, but the race doesn't fall apart until so late right. that you almost don't notice it. If it yeah. was a mile and a 16th, and it fell apart at the 16th pole, but you know, it's, you can't you can't expect these riders to make every perfect exact move. Javier, maybe he mistimed it by that much. You can't really criticize that. Well, and the other thing too is when you're cre creeping up into that position, you're trying to keep the field together. You don't want them to spread out and blow you eight wide. So you know you, you'll tend to go forward to keep the guys inside of you locked up. But then when you kick on, it does spread the field out and give a horse like that option. Yeah, I mean they were all coming at the end, but uh, force the pass, as you say, he came. Through through traffic, and you don't see horses come through traffic like this one. I mean, everybody was sort of together at the 16th pole. He's the one that surged forward the best. Yeah, a, a great race. I mean, when you yeah. have basically the whole field within shot of, of the camera lens, I mean, that, that, that's a good race. Yeah. And you know what? I think it should be a great source of pride to Dan Silver that he created that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they got a terrific 11-horse field. Right. Horses came from California. They came from all over. It's a very big purse, but people showed up. Right. Fills a, uh, a bit of a void towards the end of May regarding three-year-old turf milers and the uh, winner, by the way, a cult by Spitestown out of the good race mare Social Queen who was more, I looked her up, more of a bogey kind of gallerette, grade two, grade three horse, but a decent one for Alan Goldberg. Let's get on to the Phillies and a barn that is brimming with 
uh, top three-year-old Philly talent on the turf. Chad Brown, who gets the money here with strict compliance. I bet the speed horse tried to steal it on the front end with a little bit of pedigree at 15 to 1. An exciting race. Quality Rocks had no excuse. And you can really see that in some ways, Richie, the horse in front looks like she's going better than Quality Rocks is into her. And you could say the same for strict compliance, but she ends up nailing him at the wire. Yeah, he was actually on strict compliance early. I thought she, he might be in trouble, but she kept coming. And uh, a, a good horse race. I think there's one of those races where Javier's keeping an eye on Jose Lascano, doesn't want to let him get away. And uh, like you said, the filly on the lead, she looked like she most traveling best of all, and maybe just not quite as good as those. Maybe not quite as good, and maybe the mile just a stitch too far for her. And you know, you talk about Javier, and you talk about the other rides. In this case, being aggressive and following his target is what got the, jo the job done for him, and that's why he's winning all these races. And that's why criticizing the first ride in the Penn Mile is ultimately unfair. Well, yeah, yeah, and he's just riding too well to really have any criticism hold uh, any real weight. Um, it also helps when you're riding for Chad Brown, who the embarrassment of riches just rolls on. I mean, with his, you know, fillies on the turf, I mean, you think about Lady Eli, where does this filly fit in in that big picture? But it shows that a trainer that's sharp and really paying attention can manage and find spots where they all can excel. Well, he'd entered this filly in the American Oaks of California along with two others, and this is the one he decided to keep here and run here. He thought this was a better spot for her, and it turned out to be the right spot. Got the money in just her fourth lifetime start. She's now three for four and a filly by Into Mischief. Let's see how the uh, Chad Brown duo did out on the West Coast against a fellow group of short field in the three-year-old filly American Oaks. Odds on favorite, who's based out in Santa Anita, got the money in this one. That was uh, Spanish, Spanish Queen. Queen. Nice ride here by Brees Blank. Did not love the ride that Prot gave the uh, seven horse consumer credit, who's got a little bit more speed. I thought he took her out of the race, and she'll get in trouble in the stretch. I'm not sure she was best, and it's not sour grapes on my part, but I think she didn't get her best chance with this ride. I, I, I'll say it flat out. I thought she was best. I, I thought especially when he, get, he encountered the trouble turning for home at yeah. a key point in the race. He did it again. Yeah, and, and, and you're losing momentum at that point. Um, Spanish Queen got an absolutely picture-perfect trip, set the pocket, handful of horse, got out when he needed to, and maybe uh, Flavian Pratt should have been following that path instead of trying to go inside. When you've got the three to five favorite making that move, you know that you're not going to be able to get through inside because he's going to be able to hold those guys together. you got to anticipate a little more, and I think he's been riding really well. I don't think this was one of his better rides. No, it, it really wasn't, and, and he cost a potential victory to consumer credit in this race, and it'll be interesting because you have to think the Spanish Queen's connections are planning to come here for the Belmont Oaks. I mean, it's a million-dollar race, mile and a quarter, same as this one. She's not getting this kind of trip in all likelihood, and nothing annoys me more as a horse player, mm -hmm. and I didn't bet this race, but if you bet against a three to five shot and the horse gets an absolutely perfect trip to beat you. If they're three to five, you bet against them. You want them to earn it. Yeah, I mean, and she, this is the perfect turf trip, really. I mean, yeah. save every inch of ground as long as you can. Come out when you, the, the opportunity presents itself. Right here, he's going to slide to the outside, and this is where you're going to see Flavian Pratt's going to be looking to go inside there. I think at that point, you got to be a little more patient, wait, and follow her move. Follow her path. This was really bad, because he goes in there, and it's like, dude, where are you going? And with a filly that had run on her mind. Yeah, she yeah, had a she lot of run. To run. And, sure. and the other thing is, once you do that, and now you angle them out, it takes them a number of strides to get back in their rhythm, and it absolutely cost her second. Could she have won? It's not impossible in here, but he definitely killed her momentum. Yeah, well, again, I'm going to go back to it. I think she was the best horse on the day. She wound up running into basically a blind switch there, and uh, you have to anticipate. That's what your best riders do. They give themselves more than one option, and they anticipate what's going on in front of them. His anticipation there really wasn't there. He just didn't anticipate where he was going to go when he got to those horses' heels, and he didn't give himself any options. No, he really didn't give himself. In fact, he, did, he, he almost determinedly gave himself no other options. Now, Lady Eli is running later this afternoon at Belmont Park after we tape this show, mm -hmm. and I think she's running against a very strong field. Now, obviously, she's much the worst to beat. She's trying to go a mile and an eighth. I think that field running in the prep race to wonder again, the prep for the Belmont Oaks at Belmont, I think it's a much stronger field than this American Oaks. Well, it's interesting, and, and you know, I think Lady Eli is brilliantly talented. My question about Lady Eli, when you have a horse that possesses that kind of brilliance, how far will she stay? Because they give it to you instantly. When a rider asks for it, the acceleration's there. You just can't 
think it's going to last that long. Well, can she ramble along for a mile to a mile and a sixteenth and then explode at a mile and a quarter? And, of course, you can only hypothesize until they do sure. it. She'll go the extra distance today and try to get a mile and an eighth, and we'll see how she does in that situation, and she meets no easy horses. But that field is full of a lot of good horses, and I think because of that question with Lady Eli, people aren't going to be afraid to take her on, and especially for a million dollars. Well, unless she does something just extraordinary today. As uh, usual. Uh, and, and what she does, I mean, um, you know, you think back the race, breaking her maiden, she won by a nose with all kinds of trouble. And I think it pointed out she had talent. You didn't know what was to, still to come. It's funny. I watched the race. I was watching the, I was at Keelan with Chad Brown and the day she won her return race. And he said to me, we're looking at the horse who was in front of her. It was a really good horse. I think the horse who ran second the Mears Cup. Glow, right? Yeah. And Chad said, how would you like to be that horse? You're cruising along all happy. And you turn around, you see that beast sitting outside of you. She is a beast. <laughs> she's been a good one. Perfect four for four. Many think she's, in fact, the best three-year-old filly in training over any surface. We'll see how she did on Sunday. Check out Belmont Insider on YouTube. And much like that group from the gate, we are charging towards the finish line here on the Racing Report. We're back on the National Racing Report, approaching the eighth poll or so on this show, but a great week remains right in front of us. And check out the lineup for this coming Saturday. Belmont Stakes Day, 147, an 11.35 early post because we've got to cram a lot into a few hours at the Old Palace. Six grade ones on the card, none more important than that Belmont Stakes with the purse of $1.5 million. We see the best in a number of divisions, and this is either going to be a very profitable day in my pocket or a day that cost quite a bit of money with those guaranteed multi-race wagers. Yeah, but the good thing is that no matter how much we blow at the window, it's going to be a great day here at Belmont yeah. Park. I don't think any of us are going to leave here disappointed, regardless of what happens. No, just so many strong categories in the Met Mile, obviously, the Belmont Stakes for the Triple Crown Line. We're, we're really lucky to be in this position. Great. All right, dark the next few days. We're back at it. Belmont Stakes Festival kicks off Thursday, and hope you'll uh, check out Talking Horses, and of course, that Thursday card. Back out to Penn National. Ben's cat, the stalwart nine-year-old gelding, six to five favorite in this Governor's Cup. I think he was a real unlucky loser. I, I think he uh, a couple things went against him in the stretch. Uh, uh, eventual third place finish in Bolt Thunder, drifting out, kind of hampering his forward progress a little. And he changed leads really awkwardly, Andy, and I thought it slowed down his momentum. Yeah, you and I were watching this as we were doing the Insider Show. I was doing a little lean caught on air. <laughs> I mean, let's face it, Jason. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter. I didn't bet the race. How do you not root for Ben's cat? No, oh, he, he's he embodies what the what's everything good about the game, and he just keeps showing up yep. at his advanced stage, and he, he's an honest horse that brings his lunch pail and goes to work. Now you'll show with the horses drifting up front, and that's both runners in front. Now I thought it was a great ride by Jose Lescano, and the eventual winner, Amelia's Wild Ride, because he got his position going forward, and he spread the field out. We were talking about this up okay, Now you see right there, Ben's cat finally changed leads after Julian Pimentel had asked him several times, and it took him about three strides to kind of recover from that little. Bit of bobble he did, and then he took off running again. Yeah, no, he, he, you know, you almost hate to see him lose. You don't want to take anything away from the winner, and you don't want to miss the ride that Jose Lascano gave, but. Ben's cat, he could have gotten it done. He's also getting a little older, Richie. Yeah, He's nine right, years old. And you're going to see it's coming up right here. He had already asked him two or three times to do it. And you're going to watch this little stutter step coming up. And he's going to wait right there on his right lead. But you see he kind of half bobbled. And I thought it broke his momentum just a touch. And then he recovered and, and kind of rallied again. And, and when you get beat a nose... Those things count. Right. Oh. But, I mean, if he stays on his inside lead, is there an argument that he doesn't get within a nose of the winner, or does it not matter? It, it's, it's a fair argument to me, to me visually. It seemed like he was running. And it almost slowed him down more. And, and sometimes you'll see riders get too preoccupied with trying to make a horse change leads. And I think it breaks their momentum more. There's subtle things you should do to help a horse change leads. But if they don't do it, just ride them. Let you them think, go forward. Do you think part of it was the drifting going on that you can't really see as clearly on the pan shot? Uh, absolutely. Because... A horse has to kind of take that step. When you get a horse constantly coming out into you, it inhibits your ability to jump over to your lead smoothly. And I think when he finally switched, he was being hampered just a little bit by the horse drifting. Not enough to come down, but enough to make it uncomfortable.
He'll live to fight another day. Ben's cat. Maybe we'll see him in the Big Apple. We know we'll have King Leatherberry in Saratoga Springs this summer when he gets enshrined in Racing's Hall of Fame. Let's move it ahead. We get to the action at Churchill Downs. A reigning sprint champion making his seasonal debut in work all week who suffered his first career loss on the dirt after bobbling a little awkwardly from the outside post. I love that Travis Stone, the announcer, picked up on his bobble because he's got to focus on work all week. He's the Breeders' Cup winner. He's the worst they're focusing on. But it was not a bobble, and I, this is not about Travis, that cost him any considerably. And for the chart caller to say start good for all but work all week, when you consider the nonsense that goes on the start that never gets noted, that's pandering and it's going to mislead people because the start isn't the reason this horse got beat. No, he got beat by a very good horse. Maybe he was a little fresh work all week. Maybe he was a little too keen. The winner got a better trip. And the winner was very good. Yeah, no, I agree. I think he lost because he was second best in this race. Doesn't mean he can't turn the tables going further, but it wasn't the bobble, and I hate when the chart calls that much attention to it because we see horses bobble like that all the time, Jay. And it's misleading because that'll wind up potentially in the short comment, and that will be something horse players focus in on if they're not watching the replay and the head-on to see it was an awkward bobble, but a bobble going forward that cost him no position whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, you put bobble in the chart. You put it in the bobble of the chart, sure. but you don't focus on it the main thing. Regardless, Work All Week is a really neat horse that shows up every time, but this horse, Halsvid, he's not a bad horse either. He's run some very fast races at Oakland Park. And he's ridden by Chris Landaros, a kid that I got to ride against in uh, Southern California. A very, very talented kid who I was talking about for a long time. I believe he is the son-in-law of Ian Wilkes. Is that right? I, I believe you're I right. think he yeah, actually yeah. is. Yeah. It's funny because I'm going to be ripping him apart on Talking Horses a little later on Sunday <laughs> because he rode a horse for Ian Wilkes at Churchill that he absolutely buried, and I thought it was funny because somebody said to me, it's actually his son-in-law, and I said, wow, how was the dinner that night? Yeah, yeah you wonder about that, right? <laughs> well, you've got it all in the family, but uh, honestly, I, I, a kid that I've liked, a really um, sincere, thoughtful kind of rider, somebody who works at his craft, he... Um, is really kind of catching on in Kentucky. Maybe threw in a bad ride. Listen, everybody gives a bad ride. Down this was a great ride. He looks pretty yeah, on no, the this, horse, this, though. This, nice finish. Real strong. This yeah. was an exceptional ride because he's got a horse that's got the rail, and he managed to let the other speeds go, but very, very quickly got himself off the rail and into yeah. position to stalk the pace. It's not that easy a thing to do. Well, and to follow work all week and talk about a rider doing their homework. He's the horse to beat. You know he's live cover. He's going to go forward, and i got to be where I can follow him. And, and, and that's what we talk about when you talk about anticipation. A lot of anticipation is also preparation. No question. Maybe work all week. Vanderbilt kind of horse for Saratoga. I'd like to think so. I remember there was some talk of him running there last year. It's a grade one at six furlongs. Right. How do these horses not show up for these races? On dirt in the middle of summer. At Saratoga. It's a grade one, guys. Show up. We want to see work all week. We want to see Alsman. And we, you we would imagine all. we want Eric Gio back at the spa. Don't and he worry. Was, he'll be there. He'll, he'll definitely, definitely be, be there. Him. Well, he'll, he was out in Southern California. I saw him, uh, you know, pre-race uh, paddock uh, shots on the Santa Anita feed. With Moreno in the Californian, he was the big favorite, but he did run second on Saturday. But he showed up with his usual determined good effort. I really want to talk to Richie about this because Cornelio, I think he knows this horse. He goes all in with this horse. Did it cost him a little bit? Because this was quite a battle down the stretch. I think he was second best, ultimately. I think he was second best, and I think tactically Gary Stevens was waiting to pounce when Moreno hit the front, not giving him an opportunity to blow up the way he did. Now watch Gary Stevens third in the clear with a yep. white cap. Watch as soon as Moreno hits the front, look at him go all in. From He basically went from sitting still to really driving on his horse because he didn't want Moreno to get that confidence. When he hits the front and opens up, he his confidence blows up, and he attacked him, and I think it was a real tactical thought-out move. Yeah, no, it's very, very interesting. What's also interesting is Moreno doesn't have an explosive run. He doesn't explode away from the speed horse, so obviously that made it easier for him. Now, Catch a Flight engages him top of the stretch, and your initial thought is Catch a Flight's just going to blow by him. Yep. But I'll tell you something, Moreno fought him every inch of the way. This is a good horse race I'm between really two nice race. horses. And Moreno's a horse, I've got to say, I, I underestimated him through much of his career. He is a, he's a, just a very solid, honest game handicap horse. Oh, no. I mean, what can you 
you say about this horse? He's just, he's terrific. And he's the kind of horse I, I know I like, and I think we all like. He's got speed. He uses that speed as a weapon. And he's learned to rate a little bit. And let's give Eric Eo a little bit of credit for that. He's not a runaway horse on the front end. He can rate. No, he can rate. He's comfortable out in the clear. And uh, I, I think the half a length, though, is as hard as Moreno fought. Might have been a little misleading. I thought Gary Stevens made just enough use of his horse. He really didn't go to the whip much. He kind of tapped him on the shoulder. I thought this was a very, very confident ride, but I thought he keyed his race around Moreno, and rightfully so. And I imagine both of, both of these horses will be going towards what used to be the Hollywood Gold Cup at Leighton Santa Anita. Now, we know that Moreno's coming to Saratoga with Eric Eo. He wouldn't miss Saratoga for anything. I don't think we see catch a flight. He probably stays in California, and without shared belief, and presumably without California Chrome, there's a lot of room at the top. No, and this horse is pretty good. Uh, bred in Argentina, son of Giants Causeway, who's now got three wins in this country and legitimately took down a good horse Saturday evening. But he was third, beaten four and a quarter lengths to shared belief when they ran together in the Santa Anita Handicap, and he's a very good horse, but it shows how good those horses are. Yeah, no, no doubt, and just how good Richard Mandela is with South American right. imports. He's got this horse for the dirt. He's got Bali Bali for the grass. And just over the years, think about all the Argentine or South American horses, I should First say. thing I thought of when they hit the wire, classic Mandela, and as we learned, classic Gary Stevens. Let's get on to uh, Pletcher, a little Pletcher and Javier to wrap things up. Our uh, last race is the Mountain View Handicap run as the third race Saturday at Penn National. Uh, even though Golden Lad found himself essentially chasing inside, he turned this 11-horse cast into basically a paid public workout. He destroyed this field. Absolutely buried the field. They had the track sealed, and they were running. They ran four of their first five races in the turf. They have no lights on their turf course, so when they're going to run turf races, it has to be early in the card, even in the summertime, really why they only can run then except on day cards. Golden Lad's okay for Todd Fletcher, but he found the right field. He found the right field. What impressed me was he wasn't in the most comfortable position. When you're the horse on the inside chasing, and then when he got his head up in there, you could see right here he was just going to explode. Kid Cruz did run well, though, huh? I agree. I mean, let's look at him. He's in the widest of all the horses. And in races where it's dominated by a horse in the front end and also the favorite, and only one horse makes that kind of run, and he makes it by circling around the entire field, that move has to catch your eye. And I think it's an indication that Kid Cruz is back. Yeah, oh, absolutely. You know, and, and I, I think on a different surface, because like you alluded to, the sealed track, they're running over the top of the ground. It's got to make it tougher for speed uh, for closers to catch speed horses. Well, you watch that race. It's not like they were going slowly up front and nobody else closed but King Cruz. I mean, King Cruz, I don't, I'm not saying he's going to win the Whitney, but I think it's an indication that we can start seeing some good things from him. And speaking of good things, for a barn that already has commissioner, constitution, potentially palace malice, and now Golden Lad, who was very good Saturday evening at Penn National, what you guys think of my Lutz 103 buyer for Todd Pletcher winning on Friday. Certainly a good start, and I imagine all these guys are thinking about races like the Suburban and those races going forward as we head to Saratoga. We'll find out if they're good enough. A lot to look forward to, not just Belmont Stakes Weekend. Right, and speaking of Belmont Stakes Weekend and Belmont Stakes Day, we'll have a complete recap kicking off with the 147th running on the Belmont Stakes a week from now on the National Racing Report. Do not wait. Get those Belmont Stakes tickets. You cannot get them Saturday on track. Belmont Stakes Stakes.com. Have a great Triple Crown bid. Enjoy Belmont Stakes Festival. We'll see you next time right here on the National Racing Report.